And today we will see distance vector, which is illustrated by this slide um, that shows roads with cars, because distance vector has, uses the same signaling idea as we use when we don't have GPS for navigation, but we go to Paris, for example, by following road signs. It's possible to drive from here to Paris by following road signs. Uh, and this is the same idea that's used in distance vector. If you follow the GPS, that's another idea of routing, which is called link state routing that we will see a bit later in the course. Distance vector and link state routing are the two main methods for routing in the internet. In the lab, we will see only one of the two, distance vector, uh, because we don't have time to see both and the practice uh, takes a lot of time. Routing in general. What is routing? The word routing is, is overloaded. It means packet forwarding at the layer three. That's one usual meaning that we find to routing. I prefer to call that packet forwarding. Uh, so when we say a protocol is non-routable, it means it's a protocol that does not work on top of IP. So that's the one um, meaning for routing. Routing in this specific case, a routing protocol, doesn't mean IP or network layer protocol. It means the control method that we use to populate the routing tables or the forwarding table of the routers. Bridges use a bridging protocol, which is the spanning tree, to build a tree, and then they populate their tables by simply observing the source addresses. Routing is based on very different methods, as we will see. So the important thing is to uh, know the goal. So the goal is to be able to uh, have all the routing tables done. Normally, it's done only between routers. It can be done in hosts. We have seen that your PC or your Mac can be a router. Uh, so it can also run a routing protocol. But normally, for example, at EPFL, all the EPFL routers will not allow your, your PC or your Mac to participate in the routing protocol of EPFL. They will, you will need to authenticate uh, to the next router to whom you talk. And if you don't know the secret, you will not be able to do it. And if you know the secret, I'm sure you will generate an alarm somewhere because they will see a new router coming up in there uh, on the map of their network. So normally the routing protocol is under the control of an organization that runs a collection of routers and is done by routers, not by hosts. Hosts have also routing tables, so they must be populated also. But normally, the only thing you find in, the only interesting things, there are lots of things we see, but the only interesting things is the default route, the default gateway, the next hop that is in host and that is normally obtained from DHCP or Slack if we use IPv6. So hosts normally, all they need to know is how to go to the next router. Routers need a bit more. In fact, the only thing that routers need, in principle, is to know how to find reachable destinations. How to know, I have a packet to IP address 200, uh, 251.4. How does my low next hop router know whether this exists, whether this is a reachable uh, address, and if so, where to send it? In fact, the router will not know whether this is a reachable address, if it's a local router. The only thing it will know is in which direction to send it, if it exists. And in order to do that, it will use a method that's based on finding best paths to destination. What does best mean? Think of it as shorter, shortest path, for example. Shorter can mean shorter in the sense of number of hops. That's a very frequent case we will see. But it can be also shorter in the sense of time or whatever, whatever other metric is of interest to a given application or to a given provider. How does a routing protocol find the shortest paths to all possible destinations in the world? There are many, many methods, but in practice deployed today in the internet, there are uh, five methods. Uh, only four can really be called routing protocol methods. Distance vector. With distance vector, every router 
keeps an information about only its, uh, keeps only local information. A router knows, in order to go to that prefix, I should go to interface 1, ETH1 or ET. In order to go to that other prefix, I need to go to interface 2. So it knows only its local decisions. This is the analogy to the road signaling. If you are in an, at an intersection in a big city, you will have something that says, uh, in order to go to Lausanne, go this way. In order to go to Bern, go that way. And then other directions, which is the default route, go that way. And you hope that following the other directions, you would uh, somehow uh, go to the correct direction. It doesn't work perfectly in the road system. You still need a map and a vague idea of which direction to go. But that's the idea. For a distance vector, of course, you have that for all possible directions in the Internet. You must have uh, all those road signs saying where to go. So by having only local information, we can have global routing possible. So if you think about it, that's very smart. That means uh, we're able, by the collection of only local information, to have something that is consistent and works globally in the Internet. We will see how this is possible. There is another method, and those are protocols like RIP or EIGRP that are developed in many Cisco enterprise networks, or RIP in small home or enterprise networks, use that method. Another method is called link state. This is the GPS, the navigator method. Here in link, with link state, you have a map of the network. A map means, like we draw on the board when I saw N routers, or you do it in, uh, in uh, GNS3, you see your network, you know all the links, and then if you have that, you're able to compute the path for all possible destinations. This is called link state. Every router has a detailed map of the entire network. And protocols that do link state are essentially the most widespread one. is called OSPF, Open Shortest Path First Network that is used by some carriers, some big backbone networks uh, that use this method. We'll talk about it a bit later. Path vector is another method that's used only in BGP, so we'll talk about it a bit later. BGP is the method of routing between domains. Routing is separated into methods that are used inside a domain. A domain is, for example, EPFL. Between domains or between networks, we still need to be able to route and the second level is called exterior routing and there is only one protocol for doing it, it's called BGP, we'll talk about it abundantly in the last module of the course. There is another method called source routing that we will see in a second that is used in uh, some ad hoc uh, networks and as an alternative to a routing protocol it's always possible to configure the routing tables using manual configurations or using uh, software that automatically does it. Of course, this is not nice, but this is what you did in one of the first labs. There's a fundamental problem in doing that, is in order to be able, if you want to do it remotely, you have a chicken and egg problem. If I want to go and configure in a remote router the rules uh, for routing, I need to be able to go to this router. But in order to go to this router, I need to be able to have all the rules for a path between the management station and this router. So there's a delicate problem for doing that. Most of the time, this is not done except for additions to routing. So those methods, one, two, three, four, are used for routing. Then if you want to do special things to routing, we'll talk about that in a, a bit later. Like if you want some special destinations to be handled differently, then you can still do uh, this out-of-band approach. One word on source routing, we will not see it in the lab, we will not see in detail the protocols that use source routing. The, there are protocols like uh, token ring protocols or DSR that's used in ad hoc networking. The idea of source routing is simply to say what source routing means, it means it's the source that must know the route. So here, it exists under various forms. Here it's the form that is inspired by the token ring bridging protocol that uses source routing. A has to send a packet to B. So A will send destination address B. And then in some routing information, it will describe the path that is to be taken by the packet. So the path is a sequence of interface addresses or port numbers. So when this packet, this first switch, this first intermediate system, which is a router, for example, in the case of DSR, receives a packet, it 
go, it looks at the destination address, it sees it's not me, therefore it goes into the routing uh, information, it sees the next thing to do is send it to port number two. So we'll send it to port number two and it will update somewhere a pointer that says now uh, you need to move to the second field of the source routing information. The next hop will use the second field, we'll also send it to port number two and the last hop will send it to port number four and in this way it will reach B. So it's very stupid, it's uh, not so smart. Uh, the idea is that it makes the jobs of the intermediate systems very simple. So this is one of the motivations to do in ad hoc routing protocol. Ad hoc means, uh, assume some of you in this room want to build a network with their laptops uh, using Wi-Fi in ad hoc mode, and then you want to go more than one hop, then uh, your equipment is probably not designed to be a, a high-speed router, so you want its job to be as simple as possible. Then uh, you we use this method that makes the intermediate system job uh, completely simple. In fact, there is no routing protocol in the intermediate systems. Of course, there's a trick somewhere. How can we do route discovery? How can the source A know that the sequence of ports to send is that one? And this is done typically by a flooding protocol. A will send a packet that's flooded everywhere that the network has loops, so some of those packets will loop and will be discarded because you will detect uh, that you've seen this packet several times. And hopefully one of the packets will reach B, probably several in this network that has a rich interconnection. Uh, several packets will reach B, and if that happens, when B send, receives one of these explorer packets, for example, it can send back to A the first packet that has arrived, the first packet is probably the one that has followed the shortest route, the shortest path, and this is the idea that is used. In the IP context, this is in theory possible. There is a header extension in IPv4 as well as IPv6 headers that is called source routing information. This is called strict source routing. Strict source routing here means the route contains a description of all the next hops. In IP, there is also another option that is called loose source routing, which is not a solution to the routing problem, but it's something else. Loose source routing is like if you do a train schedule, is the equivalent of the via. You want to go from Lausanne to Zurich via Bern. That means I want to go via Bern uh, as an intermediate uh, city. Here it's similar. Loose source routing means I want to go to destination address B, via C, that means I want first to go to C, and when I have reached C, I want only then I want to go to B. It's loose in the sense that we don't say how to go from A to C. We still need a routing protocol to solve, uh, to write the table to solve that problem. In IP, other than ad hoc networks, uh, those forms of source routing are disabled. So it's practically impossible today to use those forms of source routing because they have been used for various attacks. Of course, if you find a way to instruct a source to send via some machines, like you did in one of the labs with IP tables, then that's a very powerful way to, uh, uh, to uh, do packet observation, for example. So in the internet today, source routing does not work except for those special ad hoc routing protocols that you need to configure and run uh, especially. Voilà, that was the general story, general introduction to routing. Now let's dive into the topic of the day, which is how distance vector works. So the goal of distance vector is to compute shortest path to all destinations, where shortest means that the distance of a path is equal to the sum of the costs of associated to the network links. So if you run distance vector, you need to configure what is the cost of all network links. This is not given by the protocol. It has to be done by some configuration. There are, of course, automatic rules in many routing protocols. For example, in RIP, by default, the distance of any link, the cost of any link is one. In other protocols, you can have the distance of a link that depends on the type of link. The faster the link, if you have a one gigabit per second Ethernet link, it will have a cost that is less than if you have a 10 megabit per second 
link so that you will prefer the faster link. And the shortest path is the shortest path in the classical sense. Uh, how does it work? Well, it's fully distributed. So there is no central authority or central computation that will compute the shortest path. It's done based on only local information. And it uses an algorithm that's called distributed Bellman form. So that's what we'll see now. The, only, the, the beauty of this algorithm uh, is that the only th information that every router needs for this is the information from self to all destinations. Of course, all destinations in the internet, that is all the internet prefixes, which for an EPFL router is not so much because an EPFL router sees the world as the other EPFL routers and anything else is outside and I will use a default route. But for a back internet backbone router, the all destinations mean all internet prefixes that exist that have been allocated in the world. Today for IPv4 it's half a million. So this is not much, but still is not so small. So the only information, only between quotes, is the distance from self to all the potential prefixes. The algorithm that is used is distributed Bellman Ford. What we will see before seeing distributed Bellman Ford is see the centralized Bellman Ford algorithm. The centralized Bellman Ford algorithm is an algorithm for computing shortest path. It's an algorithm for computing the shortest path from all nodes to one specific destination. Of course, we use it for multiple destinations, all the possible prefixes, but then you need to run this procedure in parallel for every, uh, or sequentially, for every destination. So here we're showing it for one unique destination. So the goal is to find how to go to a given destination. So here the destination is node 1. So I'm taking an abstract view of the algorithm. I assume I have a graph, a directed graph with nodes and links between them. There is a cost for every link and every direction may have a different cost. There is one node that I call node 1. That is my destination of interest. And I want to find what is the shortest path, what is the, dist the distance from myself to this destination. And how does the algorithm do it? Well, it does the following iteration. It keeps a state variable, which is p0 of i for all i, a p of i for all i, which is the distance from me, uh, from, uh, sorry, the distance from anybody to that destination. And the distance from 1 to 1 is 0. Initially, the distance from i to 1 is infinity, because I know nothing of how to go there. So I put the largest possible value, which is plus infinity in this arithmetic. And then we do the following thing. We iterate. And at every iteration step, we look at the distances we had from the previous iteration. And we say, the best I can know at iteration k for the cost of going from i to 1 is the minimum of the cost I have if I go via neighbor J. So AIJ is the matrix of links, it's the incidence matrix or the, the, the weight matrix of, of the graph. This is the cost of going from I to J. So if I go to the final destination, which is one, from I by going to my neighbor J, then the cost I will have with this method is the cost from J plus the cost for me to go there. Of course, if j is not a neighbor of i, this cost is infinite, and this addition will give plus infinity. Therefore, this will not be used as the minimum. So here we can restrict this minimum over all the j's that are neighbor of i. We do this, and by magic, it will automatically become stationary. There will be, if the graph is finite, and under other conditions, we will see, there will be an iteration step where this doesn't move, and when this doesn't move, we have found the shortest path. So, more on that in 15 minutes. We do a break now. So, we will now see an animation of this algorithm on this sample network. So, I have a network here with five nodes. The numbers are the values of the costs of the links that are assumed to be the same in both directions. And inside the boxes, 
you have the values of the algorithm, which are the distance, or the best estimate at this iteration of the algorithm, of the distance from self to node 1. So node 1, of course, always put 0. The others initially put infinity. That's the initial condition. Now, if we run one iteration of the, of the algorithm, the algorithm says, at every node, for example, if I take node D, I look at what are the distances from the previous iteration of all my neighbors, E, B, and 1, and I compute what this tells me about the cost of going through to, to the final destination if I go through one of those neighbors. So if I am D and I go via 1, 1 is the final destination cost 0 plus 5, that gives me a cost of 5. If I, sorry, I should use the previous iteration. Now I am D, if I go via uh, 1, the cost is 5. If I go via B, the cost will be 2 plus infinity, which is infinity, so it's less good. I prefer the other one. If I go via E, similarly, I will get infinity. So at this iteration, what D gets is the value 5. And similarly, B will get the value 1, and the others will stay with the value infinity. This is uh, what we will get in one iteration. At this step, it's already interesting to do the following interpretation, which I call the message passing information. What I've shown you by hand waving with my stick is as if, in fact, the neighboring nodes had sent the value of their box, of their current state, to, to me, if I am node D. So it is as if node D had received from node C, node B, and node, uh, sorry, if I focus on node E, it is as if it had received from all of its neighbors the information that it has. Here, I'm in fact performing iteration two. So I am node E. In order to compute iteration two, uh, node E will look at its three neighbors. And it is as if all of the neighbors had passed the information, which in this case will give three for iteration two uh, of this, uh, of this uh, case. So we can interpret the centralized version of Bellman Ford as what I call synchronous message passing. Message passing means every node receives or asks their neighbors what is their state, and once it has obtained it, it does uh, its new value. Synchronous means that all nodes are performing the same iteration step, the index k of the algorithm, at the same time. So. Uh, all nodes wait until iteration k minus 1 is finished before starting iteration k. What we will see is that, in fact, the true distributed Bellman Ford, the one that runs in routers that do distance vector, is the same but asynchronous. There is no need to wait for uh, k uh, to be finished, and in some cases it continues to work. So that's the first uh, very useful way to interpret that, and if we continue if we do steps 1 and 2, we obtain those values here. We see that D here will obtain from B at the second step the information that B is at the distance 1, D is at the distance 2 from B, so at, at this iteration D will compare its three neighbors and will find that the best is 3 here. And similarly for everyone. Now it's also useful to know what is done when we do at, when we are at iteration two, what is in fact computed? What is the value that's in the box? Well, there's a simple answer. The value that's in the box is at iteration two, the distance from self to destination in at most two hops. So if I allow paths that use only zero, one, or two links, so at most two links, this is the cost I will have. This is the cost I will have if I use paths that have at most one link. So it's infinite if you're not connected to the destination. And it's the direct value if you're connected directly to the destination. And here it's the value in two hops. Everybody is uh, two hop away from the destination. So everybody finds their cost in two hops. If we continue, the theory says we should stop. When do you think we will stop in that case? So what is the first value of k? That will provide uh, the same. 
So here we have k equal 1, k equal 2. So 2 is not the answer, 1 is not the answer. When will it stop? So you have to transform yourself into a computer and run the algorithm, a Turing machine, and run the algorithm and see what you find. I close the poll in five seconds. And the correct answer is the majority vote. We can do the simulation. We will find that at three hops we obtain this. At, four, at k equal four we obtain that. And we see that they are the same here. So here it stops in three iterations. So k equal four is the first time when we find uh, p of k equal pk of minus one. And this is because the shortest path here, the longest number of hops of the shortest path is three which is for this guy. This guy has a three-hop path to the destination. Um, and uh, yes, and B, D, and E are two hops away. So it terminates in three iterations. This is what the theory says. So this algorithm is correct, hopefully. Or more precisely, if the network is fully connected, which means it's possible, or more precisely, I mean, a, a weaker statement would be if there is a path from any node to one, fully connected means there's a path from anyone to anyone here. If, uh, so if it's possible to find a path, then it will stop, and it will stop uh, at most in n um, iterations, but in fact, it will stop before. Be, uh, in most cases. And second, the interpretation at iteration k is that pk of i is the distance from i to 1, the specific destination, in at most k hops. This is what we have seen on the previous example. Then there is a third statement, which is uh, very important. Of course, the goal is not to find costs to destination, although when you're driving somewhere, you might be interesting to know what's the distance to go there. But once you have decided to go there, you don't care so much about the distance. You want to know how to go there. Here for routers, it's the same. It's not the number of hops that is really or the final cost to this one that's so important, but it's more the routing decisions. But the beauty of this algorithm is that the routing decisions are entirely contained in the, in the algorithm. If you know the costs and the costs of all your neighbors, it is possible to know where to go. This is illustrated here. If I am node C, and I know the values of my neighbors, P of E and P of B, then I can compare what is the cost of going from me to the destination. I have two neighbors. I can go via B or via C. I look at the cost it has. If I go via B 
and if I take the cost that is known to B, so B is at a distance 1, if I go via B, I will find a cost of 7. If I go via E, E is at a distance 3, I will have a cost of 4. This, that's the third item of the theorem, says that if we do this, we find exactly the direction of the shortest path. In other words, uh, we don't need to know uh, the destination, the, the shortest path uh, out of band, we have it automatically by remembering the last best decision we've taken. The algorithm is always computing minimum. When it converges, the last minimum we've had is also the direction of the shortest path, which is the third item of the algorithm. Here, it says that the next hop along a shortest path from I to 1 is found by minimizing this. There can be several best paths, in which case you need to have a method for breaking ties. For example, finding the J that has the smallest label, if you have a way to uh, order the labels. So this is uh, what we have seen here. Okay, that's, I would say, the simple theory of Bellman Ford. But in reality, there's a number of issues around that. So let's, let's look at them. Here is the first issue. Assume that for some reason I take the bellman ford algorithm, but I, instead of the initial values, which are the ones that make sense, I replace them by different I, I initial values, the one that showed on the graph. So for example, node C thinks that it is at the distance 1 of node uh, 1. B thinks it is at the distance 10, E and D believe they are at a distance 1. Why would we be interested in that? Well, first we could say we would like our software to be robust, so even if the initial conditions are wrong, we would like things to happen, but that's a weak argument. Uh, the true argument is networks change. You can add a node, you can delete a node due to uh, upgrading or modification of the network, but also due to failures process crashes. I mean, in the lab, you're familiar with that. I mean, things are not as simple as on slides when you have real software. So nodes may crash, may reboot. When they crash and reboot, the network changes. So those values might be, for example, the values that they had, those nodes had, before a change occurred. Perhaps there was a direct link from C, E, and D to 1, and B had another link of some kind, or those links, for example, the link between B and 1 has been newly established. Whatever the reason, we assume we start from these initial conditions and we run the centralized Bellman Ford algorithm. What will happen? What's your guess? I close the poll in five seconds. This is a differential encoding exercise. Put your guess. You will see the truth a bit later. And you have to remember the delta, if there's a delta. I close the poll now. So the majority thinks that the algorithm converges, but not to the correct distances. Let's see in a minute what the truth is. And this is, a, we'll keep the suspense. Um, let's do it for this one. So let's do it for this. Uh, algorithm here. We start from here. What will be the value of, uh, of D after iteration 1? Just to make sure. 
things are clear. Now it's not a guess, it's uh, something you can know for sure. I close the poll in five seconds. So the majority thinks one. Well, let's look at the solution. The correct solution is two. Because D will ask all the neighbors, what are your values? This one is 0. 0 plus 5 gives 5. You will ask this neighbor, the value is 10. 10 plus 1 is 11. And we will ask E, and we will find E is the best. 1 plus 1, 2. This is what this algorithm will do. Right. This is the... Uh, so D asks all of the neighbor. Of course, E thinks it is at a distance of 1. So D will ask E and will find 1 plus 1, 2, which of course is incorrect. would be correct if there would be a link of cost 1, 2, but doesn't exist. But that's what the algorithm does. If we continue for the other nodes, we find this. We find that C believes it is also at a distance of 2 because of E. B believes it is at a distance of 1 because of this link here. And, z and one is always at the distance zero. This is what we will have after one iteration. Now, of course, this is a bit strange. The interpretation that I said before of what happens at iteration k no longer holds because the initial condition, it's, it's true by induction, but the initial condition are not true, so the property does not hold. If we continue, we will find that at the second step, we will have this, 3, 3, 3, 1, 0, and at k equal 3 and k equal 4, we have, in fact, obtained something that converges and converges to the correct values. So at least in this case, we see that, contrary to the majority opinion, it converges to the correct value in spite of the wrong initial uh, values. which is more difficult to understand why, but okay, let's admit that for a second, at least for this case. Let's analyze another case. If we look at this one, I assume now I break a link. I, in fact, I break three links, bing, this red line here. Uh, now you can tell me, but it never happens. Failures uh, occur one by one according to a Poisson process, so the probability that two happen at the same time is zero, but it's could happen. For example, the three links could be placed in the same conduit, in the same underground uh, conduit somewhere, and uh, you break this because somebody with a caterpillar is doing some road construction and breaks uh, three fibers at the same time. It happens. Uh, there are historical cases when it happened. I think there was the Baltimore Airport Tunnel where uh, there was a fire in a tunnel. A fire in a tunnel can become very hot all the optical fibers in the tunnel were destroyed by the fire, and there were many parallel, many redundant links that were in the same tunnel. So some uh, North American networks, like the 1818 network, was disconnected. It had lost several links at the same time. So it can happen, assume it happens here, what would the algorithm do? So it's a different case, it's the links that have changed, and just before the failure, the values were the correct values here what will happen to the algorithm if we continue running it. Breaking the links is equivalent to setting the link values to plus infinity. 
So for example, three, if we apply the algorithm here, three will not talk to D, or if E will not talk to D, or if E talks to D, the value we'll get will be three plus infinity, which is infinity, so will not be used here. What will the algorithm do, according to you? What's your guess? I close the poll in five seconds. So the majority thinks that the algorithm does not converge. Perhaps this is true. I'll say, I'll give the solution in a few more minutes. But let's do the same exercise here before going this before seeing the solution. Let's do the simulation for this network here. And what I'm asking you here is what's the first step of the simulation for E? What is the value that I will get here? So I'm drawing the vision of the network that exists after the failure. We have a partitioned network. What will be the value of E at iteration one? I close in a few seconds. I close the poll. And the majority votes says five. Let's see what the truth is. The correct value is five. E will ask its neighbors, it has only one neighbor, what's your value? Your value is four. The cost from me to you is one. Plus four plus one is five. So at this stage, E believes it is at the distance five from the destination. C will do the same thing and will get a distance of four. Now, uh, this will not change here because two plus one, three, the, the values will not change here. But we'll see that at the following step, E will ask C what's your distance. The distance was five, was four. Four plus one gives fives. And similar C will ask E, will obtain five plus one, six. So it will increase. And at every round, it will increase. If we would continue, then it will grow unbounded. It will, the algorithm will not converge. Or if we want, it converges to the true value. It does not converge, but the true value is plus infinity. So what it is computing is plus infinity, which of course is very awkward for an iterative algorithm that increments by a finite number at every step, about the same number at every step, but it's in some sense doing the right thing. Of course, it's embarrassing if you have this in a network. All of this is what happens in reality also for distance vectors. So we're spending a lot of time on this because it does happen in a distance vector routing protocol. We see here that the algorithm converges to the correct values in the part of the network that is connected to the destination. And in the part of the network that is disconnected, it goes to infinity, which means that the algorithm will never stop. Well, here is the, uh, the final statement we can take. If we take any arbitrary initial values, what we have seen on those two examples is the general rule. If the network is fully connected, or more precisely, if every node is connected to the final, to the destination, 
whatever the initial condition, it will truly converge to the correct value, which is surprising. There's no intuition for that, but it continues to work. So it's the robustness property of Bellman Ford. Even if you do things wrong initially, it will get back on its feet. Which means even if you do things wrong, if you do things wrong occasionally, if during one iteration somebody injects a wrong value, it's like starting from there with wrong initial value. If you are not constantly injected false values, but if you do it once in a while and stop, then the algorithm will get back on its feet, will converge to the correct value. That's the reason we use it in, uh, yeah, that's the reason distance vector works. And if there is no path from a node to the destination, then the limit is plus infinity. It follows that uh, it will not, the algorithm, if, if such a case exists, the algorithm will not terminate. So those are the very fundamental properties of Bellman Ford. As we will see, Bellman Ford in, is not the best algorithm for computing shortest paths, but those properties are essential to make a distributed asynchronous uh, version of Bellman Ford. I skip the proof, I give the proof of that statement in the, th in the, in the slides because it's difficult to, to find in a simple form. So that is what we can say about the centralized version of Bellman Ford. Keeping in mind the message passing interpretation of Bellman Ford gives us immediately an intuition of why it could be possible to make it distributed. So how can we make a distributed version of Bellman Ford? Well, here is a first idea, which is not the final one, not the one that is implemented in practice. So I call it Bellman Ford prelim, preliminary version. That's the naive thing we would like to do. So what's the difference between the synchronous version? Well, like the synchronous version, any node maintains an estimate, Q of i, of the true distance, which I call P of i, which is not necessarily known to this node, an estimate of the distance from i to a given node, i, one. Also, node i keeps a record of the latest values for all of its neighbors. And the initial conditions are arbitrary, but we force, in all the iterations we've seen, an essential thing to do for the thing to work is the node one should know that it is one. So node one should know that its distance to self is zero. If you don't inject that, of course, the algorithm will do strange things. So we uh, have to force that. And then instead of having a synchronous version, from time to time, and hopefully uh, not, too uh, not uh, in a recurrent way, node i sends its values to all of its neighbors. If everybody does that, that means that node i also periodically or from time to time receives the values from all of its neighbors. And since it's asynchronous, we can assume it receives them one by one. So what happens when node i receives one value from neighbor j, then it does the following thing. It compares what it had now to the, sorry, it doesn't compare what it has now. It compares uh, all the values it has. So it has received a new q of j, but it has the value stored from all the other neighbors. And it recomputes what's the best if I go via j to go to the final destination. So here, the j here is an index, which is not the same as here. This is perhaps confusing. In other words, we do the Bellman Ford iteration. Uh, we redo it whenever we receive new information from a neighbor. And there's now no concept of cycle or of iteration. So this is exactly the asynchronous version of Bellman Ford. Then it's not difficult to imagine that if you are careful enough so that you do receive, you, the algorithm advances, there is not one node that is stuck and does not send messages, but if nodes do send messages at least once per t time second, then, and there is no message loss, then the algorithm will do the same thing as the uh, centralized version of Bellman 4. This is what this theorem says. If uh, then, uh, if this algorithm is run, and if every 
time slot of t, uh, of duration t, at least one message is received from every neighbor by every node, then it will take at most m t time steps for the algorithm to converge, where m is the time it would have taken to the centralized uh, version to work. And again, the idea why it works is that centralized Bellman Ford is robust to changes in initial conditions. So if we make the thing asynchronous, one way to think about it is like if the things don't happen at the same time, which means at some point in time, some of the nodes have completely different values. But since Bellman Ford always gets back on its feet wherever you, uh, no matter how you perturbate it, uh, then it makes sense uh, to imagine this. I don't give a proof of that, but as I said, it's easy to imagine. Here is how this algorithm would work on this example. I'm showing the same network as before. I'm showing the state of E. So E would have uh, a vector of four quantities for uh, all of its, for itself and for its neighbors. So neighbors are C, D, and B. And assume, for example, initially uh, E does not have inf any information about B for whatever reason then sooner or later B will send an update to E and this update uh, will be, for example, uh, will be its value, which is 1. Node E will perform this computation. It will now compare those three values that it has. What is the best one? It will find that the best one is the one that was just received. So it will compute that the cost to the final destination is 3. And it will also remember that the best one, the best neighbor, was B. So the next hop to the destination is B. And then the final destination is 3. And if we do that uh, long enough, the algorithm will converge whatever the order of those messages are here. So this is... I would say, one way of distributing a centralized algorithm like Ben Manford. It has a drawback, though. The drawback is that we need to remember the state of all the neighbors and keep them locally. Of course, you do that for every destination address. So if we do that in the internet, we would need to know not just what is the cost of going to the half million destination addresses, but what is the cost seen by all of our neighbors for those addresses? Perhaps it's necessary, but what if we would try to avoid having this, uh, this thing here? So the idea is simply to say, well, after all, I remember in my state information what's the best cost I have so far. So instead of remembering all the Q of J for all my neighbors, I am node I, I can do the following, that gives a variant of the distributed algorithm that I call super duper, because it's much better. It removes some of the storage requirement. And then it says, whenever I receive a value Q of J from one neighbor, a message Q J from neighbor J, Q of J is the estimate of J of its distance to one, I do the following. I compare what I had before to the new thing, the distance I have if I go via J, which is the thing here. Does this work? What do you think?
I close the poll in a few seconds. The correct answer is, is answer two. If we look at this algorithm, I mean, what is the algorithm doing? It's performing this operation, which takes the mean of the existing and something else. An algorithm like this can only decrease. It can never increase. Because you take the mean of something and something else. So either you stay blocked, stationary, or you decrease, but you, cannot, you can never increase. Which means that if you have initial conditions that are bad, that are too small, the algorithm will never get the right distance. For example, if one of the nodes believes at the beginning that it is at a distance one, when the true distance is three, this algorithm will never get something larger than one, so it will not work. So it is impossible that this algorithm works regardless of the initial conditions. We have seen before that centralized Bellman Ford does work, even if I have initial conditions that are uh, zero, for example, for everyone, uh, everybody believes it is the destination, uh, then the, the algorithm will increase. It will, not, uh, it will not fail. But this one cannot. It's possible to show that if, if we make initial conditions that are such that they are plus infinity or very large number larger than the uh, largest uh, distance at all nodes except the final de destination, which must have zero, if we take those, then this algorithm will work. Right. However, if you think about it, what it means in practice, it means you f if you implement this algorithm in a distributed way, you have to make sure that when the algorithm runs, you control the initial conditions, and that, which means you must, whenever there is a topology change, you need to rerun the algorithm. So you need to reset the algorithm, whenever there is a topology change, right. which is possible. Some algorithms do that. The spanning tree algorithm is one of those. Whenever the topology, there's a change of topology, for example, that, um, or for example, if the root of the spanning tree algorithm used by bridges dies, then the algorithm needs to be reset entirely. But that needs, you need a mechanism to detect topology changes in the, uh, in, in the entire network, which would not be nice if you want to do that in a large network. You would prefer something that adapts to changes smoothly and gradually, not forcing a reset everything here. So this is why we have another version of distributed Bellman Ford, which is not super duper, but is even better than super duper, is the true version. The true version does the following. So it is like all distributed uh, versions, every node maintains an estimate of its distance. Every node does not have, so nodes do not have to remember the estimates of all their neighbors, like super duper, but every node needs to remember the best neighbor, which is not an additional requirement because the goal of doing that is the best neighbor means the neighbor that is on the shortest path to the destination. That's the goal of this when we use that for routing. So that comes for free. Every node knows the shortest path in which direction we should, we should go. So we assume those two things. Every node knows its own estimate and who among his neighbors is on the shortest path to the destination. The initial conditions are arbitrary, anything. And from time to time, you send to your neighbors your value, which means also that um, from time to time you receive from your neighbor some value. What you do when you receive from a neighbor j some value q of j? Well, you test whether this j that is sending to you a, new, a value was your, pre, your next hop to the destination. If that's the case, you adopt the value. Your new value is the value obtained from j in this announcement, plus the configured cost from u to j. So you forget your previous value of q or i if you receive new information from your next one. If you receive a new information for somebody who is not the next hop to the final destination, you compare what you have to what you would obtain if you would go through this neighbor. 
If this is better, then that will, uh, that will improve your Q of i, your estimate. And if this causes you to change uh, the value of Q of i, then you also change your next hop. The next hop will be this j. This is the algorithm. Right? So it's a bit more subtle than simply distributing. Let's see how it works uh, on one example. So I assume the network is in this state here. And we zoom on node E. Node E receives from C the message Q of C equal 1. Um, I think, uh, yes, so I assume that before that, uh, so Q of C, uh, and E has no information, for example, if E has no information and will adopt the first one, it will say Q equal 2, 1 plus 1 equal 2, and the next hop is C. That's the uh, first thing it will do. Uh, this is a bad. This is a bad animation. Something is missing. Okay. If we continue and see, um, for example, what will have happened at node E, what other messages node E has received, we see that when node E receives from C. Uh, so how will node E uh, obtain a distance of 4? When E will receive from B a message saying I am at a distance uh, 1, for example, then E will compare to that uh, distance and will not accept it at the beginning. Uh, but sooner or later, node C also will change its, its values. So C, which is here, will have values that are larger. And whenever C has a larger value, like 4, at some point in time, then C has a value 4 and sends it to E, then E will accept this value and will uh, move it to... Uh, so C has a value... Uh, I'm lost in my own animation. I guess... This is here showing what E obtains at this stage when E receives from node B a message which is not from the next hop. It will compare it. It finds it's better. So it adopts B as a next hop, as a new next hop, and updates the value. Yes. So this is how this algorithm will work. So in, in other words, in order to find a way to be able to increase again if the values are too small, there is this rule that says if you receive something from a node that is declared to be a next hop, then you adopt this value, even if this value is less good than what you had before. And we will conclude on this uh, final statement. This works. So this algorithm works. Whatever the initial condition, it will provide, converge to the true value. So in conclusion for this theoretical part and distance vector, Bellman Ford allows to compute nodes to destination. The stored information in the distributed Bellman Ford is next hop to destination and the distance to destination. And it works by simply message passing. And if the destination is unreachable, it will converge to plus infinity, which means it will grow forever. Voila, that's all for today. We will see next week how this is used in practice in RIP.